Okay, so now I want to um, somehow start approaching uh, the third point. So we have a surface. We know we can. We know how to put a hyperbolic structure on it. So now we want to understand uh, all the different ways we can take this one oriented topological surface and endow it with a hyperbolic um, hyperbolic structure. And I mean, you can now think of. Uh, what the hyperbolic structure is in whatever terms you want to think about it. Um, so we really want to look at this space of all hyperbolic structures and there's one way um, to make this a bit simpler to look at that is to look at not just a hyperbolic structure on the surface but to at the same time look at what people call a marking. So what we really will look at is at marked hyperbolic structures. So for this, we, you think of, um, so we have our topological surface, uh, oriented topological surface of genus G here. And we have the same surface with a hyperbolic structure and we will denote it by a different letter. So whenever I have a surface with a hyperbolic <coughs> structure given on it, I denote it by X. And now I want that this, my topological surface and my surface X, I mean they are topologically the same surface, but I want a bit stronger uh, relationship. I want to uh, have a way of comparing this surface with this uh, hyperbolic surface by taking in addition a homeomorphism from this topological surface to this hyperbolic surface, but I mean I can forget about the hyperbolic structure. So. I want to think of a hyperbolic structure not just as the surface X which carries a hyperbolic structure but as a pair of the surface X with this homeomorphism. So we look at the space of all hyperbolic structures on sigma G. So this is a set of pairs X and F where X is a hyperbolic surface. and f from sg to x is a homeomorphism. But now we want to, um, we will actually model by some equivalence relation, which I want to explain now. So if we ha didn't have the marking, the equivalence relation we would take is just, well, we have two hyperbolic surfaces, uh, we identify them if there's an isometry from one surface to the other. Right? Because if we have an isometry, we can't really distinguish the surfaces from their geometric, uh, from the geometric point of view. So if we have this marked um, hyperbolic structure, we take a slightly uh, finer equivalent, equivalent relation. So assume we have two marked hyperbolic structures, x and x prime, with their markings f and f prime. We say that they are equivalent if we find an isometry here. So which has the following property if we compare this homeomorphism from this surface SG to this hyperbolic surface X prime and this homeomorphism which we get by going on the upper, uh, taking the other marking and then taking the isometry, we want that they are homotopic or isotopic people. And such that, so, if there's a, so we identify them if there's an isometry such that uh, F composed with I is isotopic to F prime. And so this turns out, I mean, not every isometry will identify the marked um, hyperbolic structure. So it's, we, have a, uh, we have a space which uh, looks, I mean, it's basically the space of hyperbolic structures, but it's a bit finer than the space of hyperbolic structures. So let me, um, let's look a bit at what, uh, uh, what this marking gives us. So one thing this marking gives us, and this is one of the key things, is that if I have this topological surface, right, and I pick a curve on the surface, so for example this curve, uh, gamma, then uh, having this marking I can say on x which curve is the curve gamma. 
So because I can just take f of gamma, and this will be a curve on x, and this is the curve with the name gamma. So it gives me a way to label curves and identify curves on x. And I could take an isometry of x, which moves this curve to a completely different one, which is not homotopic. And this would be an isometry, but this would not give me an isometry, which gives me a ma here my equivalence relation. So, so markings give us a way to name curves. And this is very useful. Um, markings that we have, this marking also tells us that we have a nice uh, group acting on this uh, space, namely the there's the mapping class group on the surface, which acts on this space. So what's the mapping class group? So this is, I take all homeomorphisms, and since I have an orientation, I want orientation preserving homeomorphisms, and I mod out by all orientation preserving homeomorphisms of sigma g, which are homotopic to the identity. So uh, if I act with this group, I can act on this space. So how do I act? I just take my marking and I pre-compose uh, with a homeomorphism in the mapping class group. And to check that this action is actually well defined, you have to, I mean, you see that if you act with something which is homotopic to the identity, actually will get to equivalent marked uh, surfaces. And if you act with something which is not homotopic to the identity, it will get actually two different marked surfaces, but as a, if you forget, if you would forget about the markings, or just think about the hyperbolic structure, they are, they are the same surface, right? So, so if you are interested in just the space of hyperbolic structures without marking, you can look at this space of marked hyperbolic structures with the action of the mapping class group and take the quotient. Okay, so this, uh, um, one other, uh, I mean, having this label for, for I mean, names for, for curves on the surface allows us to give a very nice parameterization of the space of marked hyperbolic structures. And um, we will see that this is a very nice and sometimes uh, simple, um, simple manifold. So we have uh, nice parameters. And I want to dis this is the first thing I want to describe on this uh, space. And we basically have all, uh, everything we need for that already. So there's a nice parameterization of the space, which are called, uh, called Fentinesian parameter, uh, parameterization or Fentinesian parameters. So for this, we um, use this, the idea we already used to put a hyperbolic structure on the surface. We look at pants decomposition. So we fix a pants decomposition. Fix a pants decomposition. of sigma L of SG, so just topologically. And I'm drawing here. And now if we have a if we if we have a hyperbolic structure and a marked hyperbolic structure, we want to uh, parameterize this hyperbolic structure by some a set of parameters which we associate uh, to the surface given this pants decomposition. So we actually fix uh, something slightly more than a pants decomposition. So we also fix some kind of perpendicular, I mean, well, well, not tr perpendicular, but transverse arcs here. But I don't want to go into uh, that much detail. So for each of the curves, so we have this three, let's draw them orange. So we have curve C1, curve C2, and the curve C3. So we have in general, 3g minus 3 simple closed curves. And <coughs> what do we know? So we know that if we, if we had a hyperbolic structure on the surface, and we cut this hyperbolic surface along these uh, simple closed curves, we can measure for each hyperbolic structure the length. And we get, for each curve, we get the number. So we get, um, we have. Uh, pair x, f, we get uh, the length of these uh, three curves if we realize them as simple closed geodesics with respect to the hyperbolic structure. So we have um, 3g minus 3 
positive uh, real numbers. And we basically know that if we cut our surface open on each of these pairs of pants, we have a unique hyperbolic structure which is determined by these uh, numbers. So now we have all these pieces and now we want to understand, well, if we try to take these pieces and glue our uh, surface XF back together, uh, what, uh, what can go wrong? Right? So if we take two pairs of pants, that's say with length uh, L1, could make this L1, it doesn't matter, so L2, L2, L3, L3. Right, when we want to glue the hyperbolic structure here and here, I really have to make sure that the length is the same because I want to glue the curve. But then, I mean, I glue and I can somehow have a degree of freedom which I can glue. So I have just two circles and I can rotate them uh, around each other before I glue. So there's addition to the length parameter when I want to re-glue my surface out of the pieces. There's for each curve along which I glue, I have what's called a twist parameter, which tells me how do I glue and how much I have to twist. So, so I get uh, for each curve a twist parameter tau 1 up to tau 3g minus 3. And uh, so this is a positive real number. And the one important thing, and this is again because we have the marking, the twist parameter is actually a real number. It's not just in the circle because if I take a pair of pens, two pairs of pens, and now I twist a full turn around the circle, I mean, for the hyperbolic metric, it doesn't change. But for my marking, it changes. So if I look at uh, such a curve which is transversal, and I wrap them once around uh, the point, and then, for example, I close them up to be a loop, then I change the homotopy class of that loop. So if I have this, I mean, this marking, the twist parameters are really real numbers. And now, uh, if, I, if I give you these numbers, right, you can construct for me a, a marked um, hyperbolic surface. So what do you do? You take these numbers, you construct 2G uh, pairs of pans where you somehow take the, you have the building plan out of uh, your topologic pants decomposition of your surface. So you take, you produce the hyperbolic pairs of pants, and then you want to put them together, and the twist pyramids tell you precisely how to put them together. So this way you can really associate to any marked hyperbolic structure this set of 6g minus 6 numbers and go uniquely back um, to construct the marked surface, yes? Why do you read the twist parameter on the, on the surface? Uh, where do I read the twist parameter? Okay, so, so for this it's important to have this transversal. So this is one thing which is not so uh, nice about the twist parameters or the twist, uh, the length parameters are completely canonical. So I, I mean, once I fix my pants decomposition and I have, say, this curve, I say, okay, so this is this curve in the hyperbolic surface. I take the geodesic representing this homotopy class and this has a certain length and I can't do anything wrong. So for the twist parameter, there are different ways of writing known twist parameters. Um, depending on a choice and depending on a normalization, if you want. So one thing I can do is I tend, I, so if I have these transversals here, right, I can build my reference surface. So if I, if I have these length parameters, I build these two pair of pants and now I, I glue the pair of pants and let these curves glue together, right, so that they are really glued together. Now, if I compare this with another hyperbolic surface having the same length, um, then I measure, I mean, how, um, if I look at these two, uh, this transversal curve, how did I, uh, how was it glued in the other hyperbolic? So I prefer not, I mean, we can discuss it after a bit. It's a bit annoying with the twist parameter that it's, so we have to be a bit more careful to properly define them really as a real uh, number, not just modulo the, uh, the length of the, the corresponding geodesic. Okay. Um, okay, so what does this uh, uh, tell us? So if we do Fentilinese and coordinates, we give, get a parameterization of this space, and we can parameterize it as 
just a, a, a space uh, a cell of dimension 6 g minus 6. So I mean, if you want, you, know, you could take the log of the length if you want a real number and not a positive positive real number. Okay, so this is uh, this is in some sense very nice because it gives you a very nice um, <coughs> understanding of how this space of marked hyperbolic structures um, looks like. Um, let me make a couple of remarks there. So one remark is um, it's actually not so easy and it's really difficult <coughs> to write down how the coordinates change if you change the pan's decomposition. So if you just think of the simplest example of having a, uh, just looking at two pairs of pants glued along one curve, and now I say, well, I take this, uh, this thing, which is this four hole sphere, and I glue, want to glue it in this way into two pairs of pants, and I want to understand how the Fenty needs and parameters change, it's very difficult to write down. So it's not, uh, somehow not nice and so in some sense you get a very nice parameterization but you break a lot of the symmetry. So for example if you are interested in how the mapping class group acts, right, so if you act with the mapping class group it will change the pants decomposition, you don't see it at all in these parameters, right, or I mean it's, you can't. Um, so on the other hand they are also nice in uh, other respects and I mean one thing I want to um, mention without uh, exp really explaining uh, what I say or going into detail. So if you look at this uh, space of marked hyperbolic structures, it uh, as a space in itself has a lot of interesting um, structure. So for example, it's in a very natural way uh, a symplectic manifold in a completely in a way for which you don't need to fix this fancy composition and write down the parameters, but if you look at the symplectic structure and you want to try to express it in these parameters, there's a beautiful formula of Wolpert which says that it's actually very easily expressed um, in these parameters. So, so if you look at these parameters, you can think of them as functions on this space, right? The parameter gives us, you take your point, uh, a marked hyperbolic structure, it gives you, you have this 6g minus 6 functions, and if you have a function on a smooth manifold, you can look at its differential, and this gives you one form. And so if you take the one form, which corresponds to the length <coughs> function of the curve ci, and you take the one form, which corresponds to the twist parameter, then if you take the, the wedge of it, so, and the two form, which you get by summing up this from 1 to 3 g minus 3. This is a symplectic structure, gives you the symplectic structure on the space of marked hyperbolic structures. And if you think about it, one thing this tells you this symplectic structure is completely canonical. So in particular, it's invariant under the action of the mapping class group. So I told you, I mean, it's really difficult to understand change of coordinate for pants decomposition, so that it's, it's it's a mess to understand the mapping class group action in these coordinates, but uh, actually once you do that, so taking the one form, taking the wedge, looking at this two form, it's invariant on the mapping class group. So that's one of the miracles of, I mean, of this formula. So another thing which uh, is nice about Fentian-Nielsen coordinates is that it gives you uh, immediately certain ways to navigate around in the space of marked hyperbolic structures because I can um, take one of these curves, so I don't even need the full pants decomposition, so I just take one curve here. Well, perhaps it's better to take the, I mean, it's easier to explain with this curve here. So I take one curve, I cut my surface into two pieces. I have the hyperbolic structure on the two pieces. I don't change it, but now I just re-glue with a different twist. And I can vary the twist as a real parameter, so I get something like a flow on the space of marked hyperbolic structures, which is the name of Fenchel Nielsen um, twist flow. And this again has a very nice uh, interpretation in terms of this symplectic structure, namely this flow is the Hamiltonian flow associated to the corresponding length function. So there, there's tons of interesting nice uh, structure um, in here and I'm not going to tell you more about that. 
So, what I want to um, um, what I want <coughs> to now is do uh, I mean stay looking at this uh, space of marked hyperbolic structures, but look at it from a slightly different uh, um, point of view. Looking at more in terms of um, this way, which I shortly described of thinking of a hyperbolic structure given by a symmetry group of a tiling. And we get to that um, from this uh, space as well. And for this, the marking is, again, very, uh, very important. So um, if we look at this space of marked hyperbolic structures, right? So x is a hyperbolic surface. And as a hyperbolic surface, and I explain one way to think about it is as uh, somehow having a tiling of the hyperbolic plane, taking the symmetry group of this, ti this tiling and taking the quotient of the hyperbolic plane by this symmetry group. So one way of thinking of x is to think of it as the quotient of the hyperbolic plane by a group gamma, where gamma is a discrete subgroup of PSA2R. And then we have this marking f, right? And we have this equivalence relation, which I'm not going to worry about. Okay, so if I now, and this is this is something I explained to a few of you in the in the break. So if I have a discrete subgroup of PSL2R, so the, this the group of isometries of the hyperbolic plane acting on the hyperbolic plane, it acts always properly discontinuously. This is just a small exercise if, if, if you have a discrete group, subgroup of a group of isometries, that's always the case. I get this quotient and this quotient has the, I mean the surface has the property because this is a contractible space that this group gamma is actually isomorphic <coughs> to the fundamental group of the surface, right? Um, having this marking we actually get another way, in another way an, an isomorphism with the fundamental group of the of our fixed topological surface SG, namely we can look at this homeomorphism and look at what is the map it induces on the level of fundamental groups. So it sends curves to curves and it sends homotopy class of curves to homotopy class of curves. So the marking which gives us um, a way to uh, associate this hyperbolic surface uh, um, map F star which goes from the fundamental group of this uh, surface S into, I mean, well, it goes to the fundamental group of X, at which we identify it with this discrete group gamma. So it goes to gamma, which is a discrete subgroup of PSA2R. So it, uh, well, <coughs> let me write it in a different way. So I have here, a map from marked hyperbolic structures to group homomorphisms of the fundamental group of sigma g, which is some fixed abstract um, group, into the group of isometries of the hyperbolic plane. And uh, one thing you have to now understand is what happens with the equivalence relation. And then, I mean, this is a short exercise that, the, I mean, the equivalence relation actually tell you that, I mean, you, what you get is actually well defined up to the action of PSL2R because you can act by, if you have this homomorphism, you can act on PSL2R uh, by conjugation, right? And if you act by conjugation on PSL2R, you um, don't change um, the, the, the equivalence class of the, um, of the marked hyperbolic structure. So it's like adding a isometry, uh, taking isometry of x. So, um, I think as, as defined, you're modding out by PGL to uh, As defined, uh, yes, you're right. Um, so I want to, so I have xf and I send it, so this is the map. Um, so, so I, so I can think of, uh, I mean, this uh, having a marked hyperbolic structure, I can think of forgetting about part of the uh, part of the information I have, and just remembering the homeomorphism, the homomorphism I get on the level of fundamental groups, right? 
So one, um, well, let me perhaps write one word here. So if this, um, such things actually work in also more general context of geometric structure and what you, yeah, I mean, you, if you have a geometric structure, you associate to the geometric structure, it's holonomy, which is basically this group homomorphism. So one thing I want to address now a bit is how do we understand the image of this map? So the first thing is um, that this map actually doesn't forget anything. So this map is injective. So we can actually think of of the space of marked hyperbolic structures on SD just as a subset of oh sorry, S as the subset of this well uh, space of more algebraic nature of conjugacy classes of representations of homomorphisms. So um, so but now we so if we if we think of this and here's a one other we we saw two other properties uh, uh, one other property um, of what the image is so if we have a hyperbolic structure I mean it's given by the quotient of a discrete subgroup of PSA two R not just any subgroup of PSA two R and we had already the question do we find surface I mean groups which are isomorphic to surfaces which are dense yes they exist and so this is non-trivial information here that I mean this if we think of this set of marked hyperbolic structures just as a subset of group homomorphisms it has one um, uh, it has actually two nice uh, structures so uh, note so if, if I take a homomorphism, I'll just abstract homomorphism, I write it as rho, in uh, the image of my holonomy map, then rho has discrete image. And because it, it, it was a map which wasn't used from a homeomorphism, I mean, it's also an inject, it's really an identification of, of the two groups, so it's, it's also injective. And this homomorphism itself is injective. And so vice versa, by what I said before, if I have, if you give me such a group homomorphism, so forget about all geometry, so we just have a surface, we have its fundamental group, and uh, we have the isometry group over the hyperbolic plane. Then if you give me a group homomorphism which is injective and has discrete image, you are actually giving me a hyperbolic surface because I can take this, this group homomorphism, I get uh, the, if I look at rho of my fundamental group of SG, this now sits in PSA 2R as a discrete subgroup, right? So I can make it act on the hyperbolic plane by isometries. Since it acts by isometries and this discrete, this action is, is nice, properly discontinuous, so I have a well-defined uh, quotient manifold. And this quotient manifold is actually my surface, but endowed with a hyperbolic structure. So, so this set is really almost equal to the set of uh, group homomorphisms which are injective with discrete image for just one slight uh, subtlety that I was looking at uh, oriented surfaces and I wanted my hyperbolic structure to somehow be compatible with the orientation and so basically there are just two ways and I can, I can either take the surface with the orientation I have but I can look at it also with the opposite orientation and in both cases I would get discrete injective group homomorphism. So if you just look at the set of discrete injective group homomorphism, this will actually have two parts and one correspond to orientation preserving hyperbolic structures and one corresponds to orientation reversing hyperbolic structures. Okay, so now I want to address a bit the question how do you um, 
if you, how do you, how can you somehow re recover this set here of hyperbolic structures when you're really looking at the space of homomorphisms? And okay, so I said you can recover it if you give me an injective homomorphism with discrete image. But if you give me a homomorphism, how would you give me a group homomorphism? So one way to give a group homomorphism of an abstract group is, if you have a finitely generated group, is to take the finite generators and say, okay, so I give you an element in PSL2R for each of the generators, right? Then you have to check whether the relation is satisfied. So you have to multiply certain matrices. And if the relation is satisfied, then this is a group homomorphism. But if you do then, and this is one way to give a group homomorphism, it's incredibly difficult to decide whether this is injective and it's also difficult to decide whether this is discrete. Except if you already give me, so for example, if you would give me just matrices with integer uh, coefficients, then of course it's discrete because the, the matrix, uh, the group of P, uh, PSL2C, so of a two by two matrices with integer coefficients is itself a discrete group, but if you give me them to me in a somehow uh, more difficult way, it's really very hard to check when there, uh, whether a group homomorphism given on generators is um, has discrete image and uh, whether it's uh, injective. So there's, so this is, uh, so I want to uh, give you a, a, a result and tell you about some invariant which actually in this case gives you in some sense a computable way to, uh, to understand when you're given a group homomorphism in terms of generators, whether this will be injective with discrete image, or if you want to view, look at it more geometrically, whether this comes really from a hyperbolic structure on your surface. Okay, okay so for this, um, let's start here. So let me just... Um, Recall because I erase it. The, so we look at the fundamental group of the surface, and this fundamental group of surface has a very nice uh, presentation as a finitely generated group. So we have this a1, b1, up to a g, b g. So these are my two g generators, and I have just one relation I have to satisfy, which is the, the commutator. I, B, I. Product of all commutators is one. Okay, so now um, I'm given a homomorphism of this group into P as two R. So. Um, and my group here, have rho goes to PSA. <laughs> to R, and for, so it's basically given by taking AI and sending it to a matrix AI. And I tell you it's a homomorphism, so you know that if you take the product of commutators, you get the identity here. Right? So now there's a very nice. Uh, in invariant for this for such a representation, which is called the Euler number. And let me um, give you the uh, let me tell you what the Euler number is or how you define it. We can think of it. So you can look at this um, group and let me so perhaps let me di digress a bit. So the PSA2R acts on the upper half plane, or if you want, also on the Poincaré disk, or it acts on R2. But it also acts uh, not just on R2, it acts also on the circle. So it acts on the circle, and now you can think of it in different ways as the boundary of the upper half plane. So this is R times infinity. Or if you look at the action on R2, it acts on the space of lines in R2, so it acts on RP1 in the circle. So this actually acts on uh, the circle and it acts uh, on the circle in a nice way by homeomorphism. So this is, 
So it actually sits in the group of Moonpotten. And now uh, this is one other reason why we looked at orientation preserving homeomorphisms. If we think of this action, for example, on the Poirinka disk, preserving the orientation, then the induced action on the boundary of the Poirinka disk, so on S1, also preserves the orientation on S1. So it acts in a, uh, by orientation preserving homeomorphisms on S1. Okay, so now if you look at these uh, two groups, so if you look at, I mean, this is, uh, now uh, I'm not going to explain this in too much detail, but these, these groups are actually, um, as, I mean, this is, these are Lie groups, so they are topological spaces as well. As topological space, they are not simply connected, but they actually have a fundamental group. So for PSL to R, what's basically what you could, I mean, if you think about it, what's the fundamental group? Well, basically you have to understand and you can go from PSL to R to SO2, which you can think of, I mean, if you think of the hyperbolic plane and look at the stabilizer of point, it's SO2, so this is a contractible space. So this is really the same as SO2. And I mean, SO2 is just a circle. So you see topologically, this is, I mean, this is uh, homotopy equivalent to the circle. And so you can look at not this space, but you can look at its universal cover. And um, if you look at the universal cover together with the group structure, you get a group, which is usually called PSL2R twiddle, which projects here. So this is just taking the universal cover. And this is again just as a digression. You can think of also lifting this, the action of orientation preserving homeomorphisms on S1 to um, uh, homeo homeomorphisms of the real line, which preserve the order on the real line. So um, let me not not write it here. So this is not that important, but I think uh, Katie Mann next at the end of this week or next week will tell a, uh, talk a bit about actions on the circle. So I want to make this uh, this connection here. Okay, so we have this uh, this universal cover of the group. And now if I have a homomorphism, I can ask, well, why do I have to look at it as a homomorphism into PSL2R? Why can't I look at it as a homomorphism into PSL2R twiddle? Or otherwise, said, can I take my homomorphism and can I lift it to PSL2R twiddle? So can I write this map R as a map R twiddle here and then just the projection down to PSL2R? Okay, and now when, we, when you try to do that, so whenever I take one generator, I can just lift it. So if I have the image of one generator, this AI, I can just lift it to PSL2R. So I can do that with every generator. And if I want to lift the representation, I have to do it in such a way that I preserve the relation. Right? So if I can look at the product of all these commutators, AI twiddle, BI twiddle, or I mean, if I write it in terms of row, this is row twiddle of AI, row twiddle of BI. I have all these commutators. So now the first um, observation or short exercise one can make is that if you choose two different lifts, I mean, these lifts are, I mean, they are generally different, but if you take two different lifts and you compute the commutator, actually the commutator will not depend on the lift. And this has to do, because this, if you look at it as a group level, is what people call a central extension. So if you look at the kernel here, what's the kernel? So uh, we basically said this is like the circle. So this is like the cover, uh, universal cover of the circle. So it's like R over the circle and the kernel is Z. And if you look at that in here, it's, it's in the center of the group, so it commutes with all elements. And if I take two different lifts, they differ by some element in Z, but since this commutes with all elements, I can take it out of the commutator. Right? So <coughs> when I do that, actually this commutator, it doesn't depend on how I lift, but it's not the commutator of these elements, but it's some lifted commutator map. But you have to compute this thing. So take, you can choose whatever lift you want. So perhaps I make it easier. I just keep this. Choose whatever lift you want. You compute this relation. So what do you know about this relation? You know about this relation if you project back to PSL2R, it goes to the identity, right? Because 
that's where it came from. It came from a rep from really a group homomorphism. So you know, if it's if you look at it here, you don't know what it is, but you know it's some element in this kernel of this map. So it's some element in Z, and this is so whatever you get out of here. This is the Euler number. So it's a it allows it to take any group homomorphism of the fundamental group of surface into PSL2R and associate to it an integer. Right? So there is actually a very nice um, thing that this, you can't get any integer, but you can only get integers in a, uh, in a bounded interval. So it actually takes values in 2 minus 2g and 2g minus 2. So this, we have seen this number, it's the Euler characteristic of your surface, so it takes values in this interval. And this is a um, uh, result by, I mean, depending on which context you look at, by Milner or Wood, and so it's usually called the Milner-Wood inequality that this Euler number takes values in this, in this interval. And so here's a... Um, Here's a very nice uh, theorem of Bill Goldman, which tells you that this number actually tells you a lot about your representation. So this is what 89, well, perhaps 90. I mean, in basic, most many of the things were uh, proven in his PhD thesis, uh, and then I think it's published 92. Um, so what he shows is that. If you look at this number, it actually um, distinguishes for you the, all the connected component of the space of homomorphisms. So, if you look at um, the so the connected components of the space of homomorphisms into PSL to R, and I mean you can check that it doesn't depend on the if you act by conjugation and doesn't matter. So the connected components of this space are distinguished by the Euler number. So each level set of the Euler number gives you one connected component of the space of homomorphisms. And rho is uh, faithful with discrete image. If and only if The Euler number of rho in absolute value is equal to 2g minus 2. So there it is. The, the two extremes um, give you discrete, uh, faithful representation with discrete image. And one extreme will be those which preserve the orientation, and one extreme will be those which reverse the orientation. But this tells us that the, this, if we we somehow really just start with the space of homomorphism, so without thinking about any uh, geometric structure, the Euler number allows us to find in the space of homomorphisms all those homomorphisms which come, uh, which arise somehow from a hyperbolic structure on the surface. So, so, um, i.e., so the Euler, the level set of, say, Euler number 2t minus 2. Is a set of hyperbolic structures on sigma t. Okay, and this is uh, okay. This is, uh, in my opinion, very nice, uh, very nice result because it's it gives you uh, in some uh, I mean in principle a computable way to given the representation of your surface on you know, on generators to check whether it's uh, injective with discrete image. Yes. Is there an example of a row which is injective but does not have discrete image? Yes. I mean, both ways you can. 
I mean, so, so for example, you can have a dense representation, which is injective. And, and you could also have some which have discrete image, which are not injective. This perhaps easier to imagine because you can just collapse handles and... Uh, okay. Um, okay, so let me uh, just make one uh, uh, side remark here without going into detail. Um, so you, you saw that if we, what we really used to define the Euler number is that our group was topologically, as a topological space, a non-trivial fundamental group. And we could take, go to this uh, universal cover and then you could do the same thing as well. So there, there are other groups. Um, there are other groups. So for example, the, what is it called, the symplectic group SP2 and R. So this is uh, the group of linear automorphisms of a vector space, so R to the n, with a skew-symmetric uh, non-degenerate uh, bilinear form, um, and uh, which have the same uh, which have the same features, which have the same. Feature, namely that you have a central extension by Z, Z of that group, so you have by a universal covering space, and so you get uh, uh, you get for these groups. If you look at group homomorphisms, you get generalizations of uh, the Euler number which go under the name of Toledo number. And one of the things, um, uh, one of the nice properties one has for them is that uh, some of this Toledo number, again, is, is an integral invariant in some bound. And if you are at the extremes of the bound, you can ensure that your representation is faithful with discrete image. But <coughs> you will also have faithful, and uh, faithful representation with discrete image for certain other values. So it's not. Uh, one-to-one -one correspondence, but just in one, one direction. And this gives you, so it goes, leads to what people call uh, maximal representations, and there are some, some sense, nice things one can show about them, uh, some are making, sh showing to what extent they are similar to hyper these uh, representations into PSA to R coming from hyperbolic structures and to other extents which they are uh, different. So a lot of active research going on there. And now I want to take the last uh, 10 minutes to um, go a bit beyond uh, hyperbolic structures. And I mean, this was the first comment beyond hyperbolic structures. But I want to um, make some, I mean, look at some other things where we see uh, we go, go beyond hyperbolic structures, beyond this group PSL to R, but where we see some uh, also interesting geometry attached to that. Let me get down the blackboard. Okay, so let's, um, so I basically want to just shortly mention to you two um, two classes of, of 
if you want group homomorphisms or geometric structures, so one are quasi function representations. And the other are convex productive representations. Okay, so, and to dis describe them, in both cases, sometimes we get to these uh, representation and corresponding uh, geometric structures, which are not uh, hyperbolic structures, by um, taking, so we, we have our XF hyperbolic structure, right, marked hyperbolic structure, and then we just look at the um, homomorphism from the fundamental group into P as L to R. Let's uh, just write it as rho from pi 1 as g into P as L to R. And this is a nice group homomorphism, but now we can think of P as L to R as naturally sitting <coughs> in other groups. So, for example, in the group of Möbius transformations, which we saw. So sitting in, it's naturally a subgroup of the group of Möbius transformations, PSL to C. And one can think, if we look at the, um, uh, the group of Möbius transformations, I mean, we already saw in some sense from the, the definition that it acts on uh, CP1, which we can think about uh, over this, and it actually has a nice other, and I'm not going to explain this in detail, but it also arises as the isometry group of a space with a hyperbolic metric on it, but just one dimension higher. So this is um, the group of isometries, again, orientation preserving of the hyperbolic space of dimension three. And I didn't tell you what this is, but you can take the hyperboloid model and just uh, add a dimension, a positive dimension to your Minkowski vector space and basically get them, get the model. You can also have, you also have a ball model where this H3 sits as the interior of a two-sphere, so at the interior of the CP1. And the, uh, we, here we have a hyperbolic structure, which you could think of as this as the Poincaré, Poincaré disk embedded in this hyperbolic three space sitting in here. So if you start with the group of morphism which comes from a hyperbolic structure, it preserves this uh, Poincaré disk and it also preserves this circle in CP1. And now you could start deforming this representation in PSL2C. So you have your representation again given by 2G matrices with real coefficients and now you just start making some of the coefficients complex in such a way that you still keep the relation uh, true so that it's a, it's a representation. And then what happens, so in the, if you do that, you will not preserve any more this a copy of the Poincaré disk, we will just act on the full uh, hyperbolic three space. But we'll get that in the, for small deformations, in the boundary, you preserve a fractal circle, so a fractal Jordan curve, so a homeomorphic image of the circle, but uh, fractal one, and uh, so uh, there's a neighborhood of all these uh, homo uh, homomorphisms which come from hyperbolic structures which uh, have this property and these are called quasi-fuction. Quasi-fuction representations. And there's one, um, let me just uh, point out two nice things about them. If you uh, look at this uh, Picture, so you still have the circle in CP1, and I mean, by since you are a subgroup of PSL2C, you act on the entire CP1. You preserve this quasi circle, so this fractal circle. And the action on this fractal circle is, is very bad, so it's like the action of your surface group on, on the boundary of the Poincaré disk when you take a hyperbolic structure. But if you throw out this uh, quasi circle, you have two things which are like disks, right? They are topologically disks. And the action on this topological disks are nice. So this is now not by isometries, but it's by Möbius transformations. 
and the action is properly discontinuous, so you can look at the quotient manifold. So when you do that, when you start with a quasi-function representation, you get these upper disk and the lower disk, and you get the quotient and get two surfaces, which are quotients of, of an open subset of CP1. So they still have a conformal structure. They don't have a metric anymore, but a conformal structure. And so you get from a quasi-function representation two conformal structures, and there's a uh, famous theorem which is called Bayer's simultaneous uniformization theorem, which tells you that the converse is also true. So if you give me one topological surface and you give two different conformal structures, or it could be the same, but I mean, give two conformal structures on the surface, then there's one way of simultaneously getting those by realizing your fundamental group of the surface into in psl 2 c as such a quasi-function representation. Okay, so that's all I want to say. And Dick Canary, I mean, you have one of the experts on quasi-function representations here. So when you have questions, uh, I'm, I'm sure that you're happy to answer all the questions. Okay, so now let me um, just uh, shortly say something here. So these convex protective structures is, in some sense, the same uh, philosophy. So you take your holonomy representation of your hyperbolic structure. So this is, or if you want any faithful uh, homomorphism with discrete image in PSL2R. Now we embed it in a bigger group, but um, we uh, take a different group. So we embed it um, in the group PSL3R. But in a, sp in a special way. So now we have different ways of embedding it. And the way we embed it is in the following way. So if you think again of the very first model of the hyperbolic plane we looked at, the hyperboloid model, then we have this Minkowski form in R3, and it's of signature 1, 2. And what I didn't say when I introduced it, but basically you can think of the groups of isometries of this hyperboloid model as basically the group of linear transformation preserving this form. If you want to take the orientation preserving, you have the form, so you take the w those with uh, determinant 1, and you might want to put a connected component here. So you, this, this group is actually isomorphic to this group, and this group naturally sits in, um, hold on, we have to, in PSL2R, <coughs> or if you want, put it first in SL2R and put it in there. So, so we, and, and the, the picture we, which we should draw here is, so, psi 3 rx naturally on RP2, and we had the Klein model, right? So B, the Klein model, which was the, uh, in an FN chart like a, like a disk in, uh, in RP2. And this was preserved by, uh, by this, I mean, by SO12, right? So now when we deform, uh, what happens? Uh, <coughs> When you deform, you deform the circle, so you get, and what happens is that no matter how one deforms, one still gets a domain which is strictly convex, but uh, not anymore an ellipse or a circle, and in general, I mean, it will have, as soon as you deform and you don't preserve this thing, this will have C1 boundary, but nowhere C2 boundary. So it's it's not a fractal curve. It, it's a nice differentiable uh, curve at C1, but it's nowhere C2. And then if you, uh, so there, there are two, um, there's one, one thing which makes this case very different from this one. So for quasi-function representations, if you, def if you continue deforming at some point, you will leave the set of quasi-function representations. So this fractal circle will actually break open and you don't have, uh, you don't have a, a quasi-circle anymore. So here, no matter how far you deform, you will always have the strictly convex, uh, strictly convex set. And this leads you, so if you look at the set of representations, that's also what is called the Hitchin component for SL3R, and there are uh, related things for if you go with n higher. And let me just make one last comment. So here you have another nice 
uh, geometries. So there we saw a uh, conformal structure. So here, if you have your surface group preserving this strictly convex set, you can define a distance function precisely the same way as we defined it here for the Klein model. And this gives you a distance function which does not come from a Riemannian metric anymore, but it comes from a Finsler metric uh, on the surface. And so you get this space of deformations, you can get a nice geometric structure which corresponds to it. Okay, so sorry for going over time by three minutes. <laughs>